a wow. Hey, much love and respect to everybody that's tuned in today. Thank you once again for joining me on another of these uh, presentations that I got I got going. Um, today we're going to finish uh, reading a book that we've been reading for a while. Um, it's a great book. Just want to remind everybody, in case we got some new people, uh, the information we're going to go over today is going to mention Sephardic Jewish people, Moorish people. Again, these people were people of color. These people played a key role in the uh, colonization of America. And we're going to read today. It's going to get deep. What is their connection to Freemasonry and their connection to the founding fathers and all the symbology and everything that we see in the American uh, uh, seals and our money and everything like that? We're going to talk about that today. We're going to read about that. Hope you guys enjoyed today's presentation. All right, so uh, today we're going to continue reading uh, in this book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, A Genealogical History. Great book we've been reading. This is by Elizabeth Hirschman and Donald Jates. And we're going to go all the way to chapter 10 of this book. Today we're going to read the final chapter of this book. So congratulations if you've been following me the whole time. You've read most of the book. We're going to read the last chapter. And it's called Beacon of Freemasonry. Elias Ashmole. John Skeen. An early American lodges. Just want to remind everybody to dodge the hijack when we see the whitewashed images, like always. <laughs> and it starts here saying, One of the social mechanisms through which Jews and Muslims learned about their opportunities in the new world was Freemasonry. Okay, listen to this. By way of concluding this work and drawing together the various strands of Jewish and Muslim biography in the American colonies, let us examine the origins and spread of Freemasonry, along with the story of its coming to the colonies. Taking a long view, Freemasonry evolved out of the experiences of the Knights Templar as they became acquainted, allied, and befriended with Jews and Muslims over the course of the Crusades from 1100 to 1360 AD. Although seen often today as bitter enemies, Jews, Muslims, and Christians frequently intermingled in the Holy Land. In the pre-modern period, marriages, conversions to one another's faiths were not uncommon occurrences. In his book, The Magus of Freemasonry, Tobias Churton offhandedly remarks that in 1200, the Templar Knights Ormus Leguidon returned home from the Crusades to Lichfield, England, accompanied by a group of Hainim, or pagans or Saracens, Muslims. The foreigners stayed and put down roots. Three and a half centuries later, a female descendant of the knight, Anne Bauer, would wed Simon Ashmole in the same town. Their son was Elias Ashmole, an early English Freemason and founder of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. All right, so again, his ancestors were Muslim, okay? Ashmole has not only an unusual name, but an extraordinary history. In our view, his surname was most likely originally Ishmael. Ashmoli, Ishmael, Ashmol, Ishmael. All right, big drop right there. All right, he's the son of Ishmael, you see? The guy who what? Founded the Ashmole Museum in Oxford, Freemason. Literally, his name is Ishmael. He sprang from a Muslim or Jewish ancestor who arrived in England, either with the group accompanying the Templar Knight Ormus, Leguidon, or in later influx of Jews and Moors that began arriving in England disguised as Christians, all right, cryptos, shortly after the onset of the Spanish Inquisition, all right, because they were hiding from the Catholics. That's why they weren't officially, you know, going around telling people they were Jews and Moors. Ismaili Muslims follow Shia beliefs. 
throughout the course of Islamic civilization, they have been prominent in Syria, Persia, India, and especially Egypt during the Fatimid dynasty, a time frame in locality overlapping with the First Crusades. Since the earliest Ashmo, of which there is any record in England, dates only to Elias' grandfather, Thomas, it is most likely that the family arrived in England around the mid 1500s. We have seen this clue before. A genealogical line appears out of the blue in, new, in a new country. Thomas Ashmole was mayor and senior bailiff of Lichfield, England. He had two sons, Thomas Jr. and Simon, born 1589, the latter bearing a Hebrew given name. All right, Simon. He seems to have suffered from manic depression for he failed in a string of occupations, including saddler and soldier. Nonetheless, he married a woman of prestigious ancestry, Anne Boyer, the descendant of the Templar knight Ormus Leguidon. They had but one child, a son. Elias became not only a leading Freemason, but noted Kabbalist and astronomer. As a crypto Jew, all right, as a crypto Jew, he vigorously promoted the immigration of like-minded souls to North America. All right, you see what they were planning. Allegedly, Elias, Hebrew given name, was assigned to him on a spontaneous impulse by his godfather, Thomas Otey. But this explanation seems designed to serve as a safe cover for a familial Jewish affiliation. Elias, Elijah, is one of the most revered names in Judaism. The name of the prophet called upon to attend in spirit every male Jewish newborn's birth and every Jewish family's annual Passover cedar. We might further know that Mr. Ote bears an Arabic surname, Atiya, meaning gift. Shem Tov Atiya, 1530 to 1601, was a famous rabbi and Kabbalist, a contemporary of Elias Ashmo's grandfather. The men in the Ashmo family were leather workers, a largely Moorish Sephardi craft, okay? Remember, Ashmo Ishmael is the same. Making saddles and shoes, that's what they were doing, Moorish Sephardi craft. At age 15, Elias was apprenticed, all right, apprenticeship in the same trade. But not for long, as it happened, Elias' mother had a sister, Bridget, who married James Paget or Paget, the Baron of the Exchequer in London, that is royal accountant, a post often filled by Jews. Okay, Jews, Sephardic, they handled the money through the Pajits. Elias was invited to live in London. He enrolled in the study of law, becoming admitted as a barrister in London in 1638. At age 21, he married his cousin, Eleanor. Main Warren, whose family had come to England with the Norman conquest. All right, Normans, black folks too. The surname meant one from Varine, Warren Manor. In other words, it implied that the family was serving the owner of Warren Manor. By 1644, at the age of 27, Elias was named tax collector for Staffordshire. Two years later, in 1646, Elias Ashmo was initiated into the Freemasons, at that time a completely secret organization, whose origins trace back to the Templars and which included many Sephardic Jews, all right, included many Sephardic Jews. Elias entered the secret lodge with his cousin, Colonel Henry Mainwaring. The members were listed as Richard Penkett, Pinkett, James Collier, Richard Sankey, Henry Litter, or Littler, John Allum, Richard Allum, and Hugh Brewer. At least three of these names, Penkett, Pinkwit from Pincas or Pinhas, a biblical name, Sankey from Spanish Sanco, and Elam and El Lam, Elam Me, a reference to Bethlehem, Elam are a French Sephardic Moorish origin. Edward Sankey wrote the origins of their organization as follows in the old charges. 
Good brethren and fellows, our purpose is to tell you how in what manner this craft of masonry was begun, and afterwards founded by worthy kings and princes and many other worshipful men. And also to ye that are here, we will declare to whom the charge yet doth belong to every true mason, to keep for good sooth, if you take heed thereunto, it well worthy to be kept, or a worthy craft and curious science, for there be seven liberal sciences. Before Noah's flood was a man called Lameth, Hebrew letter, as it is written in G fourth chapter of Genesis, and this Lameth had two wives, J one was called Adar, G other Selah, and by Adar he begot two sons. The one was called Jabel, the other Jubal, and by the other wife he had some and a daughter. And these four children found G beginnings of all crafts in the world. This Jabel was the elder son and found the craft of geometry. I right, listen to this. This is deep what they're telling you here. This is from a Freemason letting them know this is what he was saying, the origin, and uh, who these people were, what they were doing, the descendants were doing, right? These crafts, they call it, right? And these children did know that God would take vengeance for sin, either, either by fire or water. Wherefore, G. Wright, G. Sciences, which were found in two pillars of stone, Yet ye might be found after the flood. The one stone was called marble that cannot burn with fire. The other was called leather that cannot drown with water. Our intent is to tell you truly how and in what manner these stones were found, where these crafts were written in Greek. Hermes, all right? Here goes Hermes. Who's Hermes? Doth, right? Hermes, Hellenistic, Hellenistic, Hermetics, Greek, Hellenistic. All right, we're going right into that. Remember, the crafts that was son to Cush, or Cush was son to Shem, Hebrew letter, which was G, son of Shem, which was G, son of Noah. The same Hermes was afterwards Hermes, the father of a wise man, and he found out G, two pillars of stone, where G sciences were written and taught him forth. When Abraham and Sarah, his wife, went into Egypt, they were taught the seven sciences unto the Egyptians. And he had worthy scholar called Euchlid, and he learned right well and was master of all the seven sciences. And there was a king of other region, yet men called Hiram, and he loved well King Solomon and gave him timber for his work. And he had a son that was named Ainon, and he was mister or master of geometry. And he was chief master or mister of all his masons, yeah, master of all his masons, and master of all his graved works, and of all other masons that belonged to the temple. And this witnesses the Bible in the book 2, Solo, chapter 5. And so it befell that a curious workman, who was named Numus Grecus, and had been at the making of Solomon's temple, and came into France, and there taught the craft of masonry to the man of France that was named Charles Martel. Whoa, look at what they're letting you know what this guy was when they built Solomon's temple. That's where he learned it, the craft of masonry. And then he brought it to France to this guy named Charles Martel, Charles Martel. And all this while England was void both of any charge of masonry until the time of St. Albans. And his time, the king of England, that was a pagan. And he walled the town such as now called St. Albans until the time of King uh, Tilstone. Jet was a worthy king of England. And he brought the land into rest and peace again. And he builded many great works and castles and abbeys and many other buildings. And he loved masons well. And he had a son, yet was named Hadrian. And he held himself assembly at York. And there he made masons and gave uh, them charges and taught them manners of masons and commanded their rule to be holden ever after. And to them took G charter and commission to keep 
and from time to time masonry until this day has been kept in yet in that form and order as well as might govern the same and furthermore at diverse assemblies had been put to and added certain charges more by the best advices of masters and fellows here followeth the worthy and godly oaths of masons every man that is a mason take heed right well to this charge if you find yourself guilty of any of these yet you amend you again especially you yet are to be charged take good heed that you may keep this charge for it is great peril for a man to to force wear himself on a book all right all right so again we just read this this was from a freemason back in that time his last name is of french sephardic and moorish origin okay moorish origin this garbled tale is essentially a sephardic jewish mediated synthesis of gnostic hermetic kabbalistic esoteric traditions dating to Ptolemaic Egypt, allied to these were rituals connected to Greek priests serving Dionysus Bacchus. All right, this is deep. Remember, if you guys watched my um, creation of the New Testament videos, the Gospels of Piso, this is the God that the Romans were forcing these rebel Hebrews to worship, you know, to join in their uh, parades and stuff and carry their god Dionysus Bacchus. It's just off. We're talking about Hermes. It's the same. The name Bacchus will reoccur among Elias Ashmo's associates. You see who these people are? But I contend these symbols are everywhere. And you can believe them or not. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm talking about me, why I care. Let me show you this. In the, um, if you're anywhere around the president, your Air Force One, or you're sitting here in the office, you'll see this flag. And we see this flag sitting behind the president a lot, but nobody really ever looks at this flag and what this flag really means. What's on this flag? And I'm just gonna show you a couple things. There's more, we're gonna um, get into it later. Um, we know about the, the, the olive branch for peace and the arrows for war. There's much more to tell about this. There's 13 uh, olives and 13 leaves, the 50 stars around the shield from many one. But what's this? And what does this have to do? Why, why would I be telling you this about when we're talking about Israel? Well, when Joseph from the Bible, when Joseph um, uh, is with his brothers, he tells his brothers that he had a dream. And he said, I had a dream where the sun, the moon, and the stars all bow down to me. You mean like the sun, the moon, and the stars? That's what this is, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Nobody, nobody talks like that. Nobody says the sun, the moon, and the stars unless it's biblical. So is the concept of unity biblical out of many, one, one God. There's strong symbolism with the number 13 being represented everywhere. 13 arrows, uh, 13 uh, stripes, 13 stars, 13 olives, 13, 13, 13. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the 13 colonies. Well, that's what everyone will tell you. And that is one answer. But there is another one that many people believe. 13. What else is 13? 12 disciples surrounding Jesus. Um, but more importantly, I think the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, there's only 12 tribes, Glenn. That's way you were 13. Hmm. Except the tribe of Joseph split into Manassas and Ephraim. And those were in northern Israel. That's the northern kingdom of Israel. That's the 13 tribes. 
And we continue in the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, a genealogical history. Okay, and it says here, roots of Freemasonry, esoteric traditions. Romanian scholar Felicia Wallman links European esotericism of the type practiced by Ashmole to the Judaic Kabbalistic notion of as above, so below, meaning that the earthly material world is an imperfect reflection of divine spiritual perfection. All right. And again, we learned that when my thought videos, this was all, this is all hermetics. Kabbalistic, it's the same thing. The doctrine obviously has Platonic and Neoplatonic origins as well. Judaism, while not originating these ideas, acted as a fusion for them from the Greco Roman world to Western Europe from 500 onward. Wallman notes that the rise and spread of Islam served the same function. She writes, there seems to be evidence for at least two different kinds of hermetic worship. Hermetic worship, all right? I didn't think we were going to get into all this stuff here in this chapter. I'm reading this as I go along with you here, doing this recording for the first time. So it's amazing how all the information connects. You see, it goes way back what they've been doing. So we got at least two different kinds of hermetic worship. One group centered in Egypt, possibly around Hermopolis, which has some very traditional Egyptian beliefs, Doff, <laughs> and another type of group similar to Gnostic or ascetic Jews, engaging in religiously significant meals and other practices and communities. The term hermetism is believed to originate with a historical figure, sometimes called Hermes Trimegistus, all right, or Trice Gratis, who lived prior to the rise of Greek civilization, 500 BC. Among Muslims, he is named Idris and is mentioned in the Quran. All right, it is Idris. Check this out. All right, I did a great presentation on this, you know, when I did my thought videos. So if you haven't watched those, go ahead and check this out. It's basically what they're talking about right now. All right, among Jews, his name is Enoch. Uh oh, wish Enoch. All right, the two Enochs, yes, the two Enochs. Go check out my thought video, it gets deep. Hermes Idris Enoch was deemed the originator of all sacred texts and mathematical equations, the arts and the sciences, including writing, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, medicine, and alchemy. Alchemy. All right. Who's the hijack? Who's the hijack? All this knowledge, right? So-called knowledge, right? All this. At an even earlier date, he was linked to the Egyptian god. Doth, all right, Doth, it always goes back to the bird. The bird has the word. Follow the bird, I told you, the Ibis, the inventor of writing and all cunning arts, whose symbol was the moon. Oh, the moon, uh-oh, what did I tell you? He was the moon god, moon. You see, what you're worshiping deep down, moon. It gets deep. I didn't think this chapter was going to get this deep like that. Correlating my thought videos from three or four years ago. Wow. Several historians agree that Charles Martel of France played a key role in introducing hermetic Kabbalistic traditions to Western Europe. Martel was the illegitimate son of Pepin, major of the palace of Frankish Austria. Australia under the declining Merovingian dynasty the Merovingian uh oh we got the matrix oh Merovingian upon his death in 714 AD a power struggle ensued in which Charles Martel intimately triumphed to seize control of the Frankish Empire in 732 at Poitiers he defeated an Arab force from Spain a victory that turned back the tide of Islam in Europe and allowed the Pepinid mayors of the palace to pursue the reconquest of southern France. He was known as Martel, the Hammer, for his insistence in beating back the foe in battle. What is usually ignored in history books is that Charles Martel's great-grandmother was a noble woman from Aquitaine in the far south of present-day France named Ita, a Jewish name Okay, his mom was what? His ancestry? We do not know her origins in any detail. 
but her birth land at the time was held by the Visigoths, barbarian invaders of the Roman Empire, who had absorbed many Jews. All right, who were the barbarians? The Romans, Edomians, Edomites, and they what absorbed many Jews, so-called Jews, Hebrews, settled in the southwest of France and won most of Spain by 500 A.D. 550. Medievalists have generally glossed over her name as a form of Ida, making it sound Germanic to fit the mold of the Franks. But in actuality, it is derived from Jehudic or Judith, the archetypical Hebrew feminine name. Charles Martel's grandfather, Asi Giselle, son of Arnulf of Herstal, married Ita's daughter by Pepin the Older and Bega. Rebecca, another name strongly indicative of Jewish roots. Accordingly, Charles Martel's father, Pepin II of Herstel, was born of a woman who was Sephardic Jewish and was her mother. Charles Martel was the son of a Jewish father. The Frankish kings and their Pepinid successors often married or had for concubines women evidently of Jewish backgrounds. Charlemagne, Charles Martel's grandson, took as his last concubine a woman known variously as Adeline, Adelaide, or Adela. She is believed to be the Ur, mother of all lines of European royalty. You hear this? The mother of all European royalty, the direct female ancestor, for instance, of Mary Antoinette. Here again, history has bolderized the original name in the interest of painting a pleasing picture of royal genealogies. In all likelihood, her name was Adele from Hebrew Adina, Ironheart, and the court chroniclers who followed him in the reign of Charlemagne's son Louis the Pious pretended to derive the name from the Germanic word Adele, noble, and even confabulated it to Adelheid, nobility. That this etymology is false is shown by the popularity among later Jews, both Sephardic and Ashkenazic, or Adele in its many forms of Ada, Edna, Ida, Ethel, Adela, Della, and Italka. When Sephardic Jews began to intermarry with Europe's aristocratic families in the 18th century, again, when Sephardic Jews, we got, we're talking about people of color here, began to intermarry with Europe's aristocratic families in the 18th century, 1700s. The choice of Adelaide as a royal name reemerged as an avataristic choice. Princess Adelaide of Saxe Meiningen, 1792 to 1849, for instance, became the queen consort of English King William IV and thereby Queen Victoria's aunt. The Pepinid and Carolingian dynasties, Carolingian, Carolingian dynasties, Caro, Caro, Cara, what's Cara mean? Cara means black. Carolingian, Carolina, North Carolina, the Carolingian female, the Amazon warriors of Khalifa, the Carolingian, the dark princess warriors, the Cara, Caracate, Carolingian dynasties, Cara. Jewish strain may account for why they self-consciously styled themselves a sacred royal line, the first in Europe, the first in Europe, sacred royal line, Jewish strain, first in Europe, first in Europe, Kara, Kara, black, so-called black. Charles Martel was proclaimed a new Joshua for his conquest in the south of France, and the sovereigns of this new Israel were declared new Moses, a new David, and a new Solomon. You hear this? Charlemagne adopted the nickname David and his circle of intimates. The emperor's portrait was used for that of the biblical kin and psalmist by manuscript illuminators and other artists. Mm. A medieval scholar, Alessandro Barbero, observes Pepin brought into use the ritual recorded in the Old Testament in which it is told that Saul took control of the kingdom by being anointed by the prophet Samuel. After him, David and Solomon took the throne by being anointed. The institutions of both the Kabbalah 
and Priest King, Priest King Khan, Priest King, seem to have entered France through the influence of foreign queens, foreign queens, the princes of Judah from the Jewish south of the country. These are the same queens, Scotia, Gypsy Scotia, Princess, Princess Scotia from the Promised Land, so-called Egypt. The foreign queens, foreign. What do you mean foreign? Where are they coming from? Where are they coming from? Foreign queens. Again, Kara, <laughs> Kara, Jewish strains, the first in Europe. Priest kings, cons, foreign queens, Judas descendants, the queens, not the males. Let me take you to the great seal of the United States. It's the same eagle, right? Except where you have the sun, the moon, and the stars. What replaces it? Well, it's this thing here. I don't even know what that thing is. You don't know what that is? I know, that's pretty hard. It's 13 stars again, but strangely, 13 stars in the shape of the Star of David. Wow, why is that in the shape of Star of David? Well, a couple of reasons. One, Heim Solomon. He was the guy who helped us. We are, we are bound. We owe the people of Israel. Heim Solomon, that's why it's in that triangle. Now, what's this surrounding it? I don't know. Well, when Moses led his people out of Egypt, what did they follow during the day? No, oh, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's what this means. By the way, you can find the image on the back of your $1 bill. And if you really think that's a stretch, if you really think, okay, Glenn, that's crazy. Well, <clears throat> you're right. That one was done and I don't even know when. Um, in the 18... Uh, late 1800s is when they finalized this and then I think it was uh, I don't know Wilson or or one of them that finally said okay we're really gonna use this one all the time so let's go back to the original seal the one that Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin and John Adams recommended it wasn't this it was instead that one tell me that one Moses leading the Israelites across the Red Sea by a, a, a pillar of fire hello Look at, the, look at the clouds around the fire in the center in exactly the same position as the eagle. Listen to me. The slogan that they wanted to have was opposition to tyranny is obedience to God. Opposition to tyranny, to Pharaohs, is obedience to God. They felt Moses was the figurehead of America. And we continue in the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, a genealogical history. We're in the last chapter, chapter 10 of this book. It says here, Elias, Ashmol's social world. Remember, Ashmol is Ishmael. Ashmol is Ishmael. Having described Ashmol's origins and membership in Freemasonry, let us now turn to a consideration of his social milieu. We will argue that first, his contacts and friendships were overwhelmingly Jewish and Muslim. Okay? That Freemasonry, alchemy, astrology, and astronomy were dominated by persons of Jewish and Muslim ancestry. And three, that subsequently these same patterns were carried over to England's colonies in North America. Dudley Wright's 2005 biography of Ashmole's list of a rather remarkable set of social contacts for a man of common birth who worked as a tax collector. For example, in 1662, Ashmol dined with Hamid. Example, Mohammed. Hamid is Mohammed. Okay, it's the same thing. Hamid is Mohammed, the ambassador of Morocco. He was close friends with William Lilly, Sassoon Lilly, and Jonas more both noted mathematicians and astrologers diarists samuel pepe's pepe pepe alchemist dr robert flood or flood rosie crucian all right rosie crucian that's where you get egyptology check out my video on that and hermeticist rosie crucian and hermeticist william backhouse bacchus 
Bacchus, <laughs> that's the god they wanted uh, Eliezer to worship, right? Eliezer said, no, I ain't doing it. Dr. Richard Napier, French Huguenot, all right? Huguenot, who? Richard Napier, he's a Huguenot, Moor. Remember the Moors got kicked out of southern Spain? Not just southern Spain, I meant they got kicked out of Spain and Portugal and they ended up in southern France, became known as the Huguenots. Let's not forget that. Previous pre presentations, check out my Huguenot videos. All right, it says here, Dutch botanist John Tra Tradescant, Sir William Glasscock, and Sir Edward Baishi, Baises Bessis, among others. All right, those are his boys. So that's his close circle of friends. So you tell me who he is. That's basically what the author is letting you know. Biographer Tobias Churton provides a more comprehensive list and description of Ashmo's friends. Oh, we got more. They included the king's master mason, Nicholas Stone and royal architect Inigo Bass for Ignatius Jones, physician Robert Childe, Sephardic rabbi Solomon Frank, from whom Elias learned Hebrew, Isaac Walton, iron worker and author of the compl Complete Angler, the Contemplative Man's Recreation, 1676, Anthony Diot, first president of the British Royal Society, Robert Moray of Scotland, Moray, Scottish scientist Samuel Hartlip, heart and emblem of the tribe of Benjamin, Sir Edward Bagot, Moroccan, Bago, a type of grape, Dr. Thomas and Judith Dodd, David, Zachary Turnipenny, architect Sir Christopher Wren, painters Charles and Nathaniel Pollard, and John D.'s son, Arthur D., who was physician to the Emperor Tsar of Russia. In addition to these persons, Ashmo's own diary describes some additional connections he notes that on May 14th, 1645, he christened Mr. Fox's son at Oxford. On another date, he christened Mr. Butler's, the goldsmith's son, William. On another date, he christened Captain Wharton's daughter, Annie. And in late May of one year, I christened Mr. Timothy Eamon's Arabic Iman, son of Windsor. The following year, on March 17, I christened Secundus, son to Mr. Lacey, the comedian. What are we to make of Elias' Christian activities? Ashmole was not an ordained minister, and in fact did not even attend church. He wasn't even a pastor. Why was he Christian in these people? This is deep. But in secret circles, he had probably a lot of degrees, right? He had a lot of rank. In fact, did not even attend church. He didn't even go to church. Our assumption is that he was essentially acting as a rabbi perhaps even circumcising the boy children and overseeing Judaic rituals appropriate for newborns. This hypothesis is strengthened when he, we read in Ashmo's diary that his cousin is named Moise or Moses, surely a remarkable appellation as is Elias, in a country with ostensibly no openly practicing Jews at the time. Ashmo's had extensive international contacts suggestive of a linkage with crypto Jewish Muslim communities, the Port and Moorish Jews. He was friends not only with the Moroccan ambassador, but also the Spanish governor of Florida. All right. Friends with who? With Morocco's ambassador, Count Magalotti and others in service to the Prince of Tuscany, Monsieur Lionberg, who was the Swedish envoy to Britain, Count de Monroux, who was the envoy from the Duke of Savoy, and additionally the diplomatic agent of Venus, of Venice, Italy, the Duke of Saxony, Germany, the King of Denmark, Monsieur Serene, the envoy of the Prince of Brandenburg, Germany, Monsieur Lemire, the envoy of Prince William of Orange, Monsieur Sponheim, a name meaning from Spain, the envoy from Prince Elector of the Palatinate Germany, the Palatines, and the envoy of the King of Spain. We believe that what all these contacts have in common, and which could explain their interest in communicating with British tax collector who spoke Hebrew, 
is that they represent communities where Sephardic Jews and Muslim Moors had fled after the Inquisition. Okay, they represent what <laughs> communities where they had bounced to right after the Inquisition in 1480 of the Catholic Inquisition in Spain. All right, Muslim Moors too. One must remember also that the final expulsion of all Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula was decreed and carried out in 1609 to 1614, resulting in the exodus of 300,000 people forced to leave their homes. All right, where do you think they all went? Elias Ashmos himself in 1661 was awarded the governorship of Suriname, a British colony in the West Indies filled with crypto Jews and Moors, filled with crypto Jews and Moors. All right, let's highlight that. Who were Suriname? All right, this all connects to the previous presentations. The crypto Sephardic Jewish people, Moorish people were, uh, you know, running away from the Inquisition. They had made it to all these islands in the Caribbean and South America as well and the, and the play, places there and uh, until the Catholics had come. But they, they were there. They had set up shop way before the Catholics had come. It says here, in Ashmo's later years, we find deeper relationships formed by him with obviously and overtly Jewish and Muslim individuals. In 1682, he not only paid a visit to Muhammad, the Moroccan ambassador, he also had Alcalde at Delo and Bomonsori of Morocco to my house, and they dined with me on several occasions. As Muslims, we would anticipate that these gentlemen were being served halal foods or ritual dishes by their host. Later that same year, a Frenchman, Job Ludolf, and his son dined with Elias. And in October of 1682, he mentions giving a book in gold buckles to Mr. Hasek, Sephardic surname Isaac. Other visitors included Paulander, Johann Shodowiski, Sir Thomas Dupa, Mr. Hack or Hayak, Mr. Negos, Mr. Labadi, Monsieur Bezor, John Falconer of Scotland, and Joshua Barnes all of whom bear Jewish or Muslim names. Jewish or Muslim names. All right, so we continue uh, in the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, A Genealogical History. And we read this part of the book in chapter 10. It says here, imagery and portraits. All right, so they're going to show us some imagery that we've gone over before again in my thought videos and my hermetics, um, Hellenistic videos. Uh, again, dodged a hijack on the whitewashing, but we're going to re read some interesting things here. I didn't know all this info was in this chapter. Very interesting chapter. Hope you guys are enjoying it. It says here, let us take a look now at some of the images associated with hermetism, the Kabbalah and Freemasonry during the 1600s in Ashmo's lifetime, during the founding of England's colonies in North America, all happening at the same time, right? The author of the Hermetic text, Microcosmus Hypochondriacus, all right? Malachias Geiger has both a Jewish given it and a surname, all right? I've shown this in my thought videos again. Now they're saying this guy was Jewish, all right? Malachi, Malachi, Geiger, Malachi. An engraving from this very influential book features the tetragrammation in the heavens. The tree of life, Arbor Vita, a phoenix rising from the fire, a peacock, the peacock, who's the peacock? Astrological signs, Solomon's seal, a right triangle, and additional Hebrew writing in the lower right corner. The theme in Uno Omnia, all in one, was used by Ashmo as his own credo, and engraven by Achille Boki from 1574 features Mercury. Hermes, Mercury, Hermes, stuff, Mercury. All right, that's the hijack. Where's the hijack? Holding a lighted menorah, the fasciculus, the chemicus, 
was translated and published by Elias Ashmole in 1650. It features two columns representing the arts and sciences, Hakim and Boaz, and Freemason lore, as well as solar, lunar, and tree of life images. The Speculum Sophicum Rhodostauroticum, the Rosicrucian Philosopher's Mirror, from numerous editions in several countries around 1618 shows the tetragrammation complete with vowels indicating a non-Hebrew audience at the top center, additional Hebrew lettering, this time without vowels for a Hebrew fluent audience, appears on the shields of the heralds in the tower. Six pointed stars are in each, each top corner. Many esoteric texts copied the Sefer Jetsira, or Book of Creation, a primer on the Kabbalah published in Hebrew by Sephardic Jews in exile in Italy, the Netherlands, and Greeks by Sephardic Jews. Uh, it's not the white man. The landmark book by Merrick Kassabom, edited by John D., a true and faithful relation of what passed for many years between Dr. John D. and some spirits was published in London in 1659. They're dealing with spirits. See, that's the hijack. It depicted Muhammad, Apollonius of Tiana, Edward Kelly, Roger Bacon, Paracelsus, and John D. as learned men contributing to the knowledge embraced by Freemasonry. Many of the books sampled here were printed in Germany in cities known to have large Sephardic populations, okay? Who's really doing all this stuff, all right? And remember, when we're talking about Jews, Jews doesn't just it automatic mean Israelite. And remember, there's many types of Hebrews, okay? Many types of Hebrews, not all Hebrews were Israelites. Ishmaelites, Edomites, Moabites, and many others were also Hebrews. But of course, a lot of this also includes some Israelites that had mixed with these people, becoming so-called Sephardic Jews or Sephardic populations, right? In these towns and cities and all across Europe, spreading this, what they learned in their Hellenistic occupational periods with the Greeks when they were getting occupied and Christianized, right? With their Hellenistic Hermetic teachings. Note that the use of Judaic symbolism, the tree of life, Star of David and Lion Rampant. The English philosopher and statesman Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, a contemporary of William Shakespeare, served as a major conduit of Sephardic Jewish intellectualism from the south of France into the British Isles and the American colonies. What did Francis Bacon write? We've read this before, that America was Atlantis that America was Atlantis and that they were going to go mix with the children of Abraham and America. It is possible that he came of British Jewish ancestry as the name Bacon was not used in England before the 14th century and then apparently as a racial epithet for Jews or Muslims, somewhat as Marano in the sense of pig in Iberia. His father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, was Lord Keeper of the Great Seal of England. As a young man, he lived in Paris with Sir Amias Paulette, the English ambassador. He then served a diplomatic apprenticeship at the court of Navarre, a Protestant kingdom on the Spanish border, then throned with Catars and Jewish Kabbalists. Thrown by who? The Cathars and the Jewish Kabbalists working together, Cathars, Catholics, and Jewish Kabbalists. Returning to England, he brought word of the impending invasion by Spanish King Philip II and formed a secret society of Freemasons designed to keep intelligence secrets from being penetrated by Spanish spies. Mm. Again, what white man? It's all colored people right here, so-called Negro people. Freemasonry was thus nakedly linked with a political anti-Spanish agenda. By 1586, Bacon was publishing esoteric books such Whitney's choice of emblems and had created and presided over the Order of the Knights of the Helmet. All right, Order of the Helmet. 
reviving the style of learning he imbibed in the south of France. The secret society spawned the Rosie Crosie Society. This is who formed the Rosie Crucians. Again, Egyptology, Kemetics, and all that comes from the Rosie Crucian Society, a reorganization of the Knights Templar. Suggestion that Bacon had met refugee Templars in Navarre with a new rite of Freemasonic Brotherhood. His Novum Organum reformed logic and popularized what we now know as the scientific method. On Bacon's 60th birthday in 1621, the poet Ben Johnson delivered a Masonic ode composed in his honor. His new Atlantis, I told you, he wrote it, he said America is Atlantis. His new Atlantis about a utopia in the new world, a utopia paradise in the new world, ruled by Rosicrucians, was widely read by who Rosicrucians, who later started saying you're African. Nicholas Hager detects his influence in the plans of the promoter Bartholomew Gosnold and others. Another author wrote a book with the blatant title Freemasonry Came to America with Captain John Smith in 1607. The tangled thread extends to Nathaniel Bacon. Puritans actually Rosicrucian. Again, Puritans, but they're actually Rosicrucians. And remember who the Puritans were, crypto-Jews, crypto-Muslims. Skeen, Jonathan, Belcher, an American who became a Freemason during a visit to England in 1704, Franklin and Jefferson, and were apparently grafted together with the Stuarts and the Jacobians. They were what? They were grafted together with the Stuarts and Jacobians, okay? Now I want to go back. Uh, they had this image right here, so I want to go back and show you. Again, we've shown some of these in my thought video, or a lot of these. This is what he was talking about. Look at the Hebrew writing, the sun. You see, this is kind of idol worshiping to me. This is kind of a lot of images and symbology and all this stuff is really not supposed to be happening, right? But again, dodge the hijack, all right? You see the spear, the spear, Silva Silvarum. It says here, Francis Bacon, Silva Silvarum, a natural history compendium from 1656, all right? All right, so we continue in the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, a genealogical history. It says here, Jews, Muslims, and Freemasonry. In the present day, Freemasonry attracts adepts from all countries and religious backgrounds. Its scope is international, although it is banned in many Muslim countries because of its Jewish orientation. However, in the 1400s through 1600s, that is, in its formative period, its members were largely drawn from non-Christian or non-Catholic backgrounds, especially Jewish, Muslim, Gnostic, Cathar, Albigensian, Walloon, and similar sects. The reason is because the central premises of the groups are monotheistic, focused on a supreme deity who created the world, man and universe. There is no notion of messianism, a trinity, saints, demigods, and the like. Medieval Arabic philosophers such as Avicenna and Jewish philosophers such as Maimonides, both of whose philosophies fed into Freemasonry, espoused beliefs consistent with Neoplatonic worldview, grounded in movement toward human perfection, reflecting that of God to be achieved through a sense of oneness, communality, and rationality. In Jewish tradition, this idea encapsulated the phrase tikkun, olam, or perfecting the universe. These principles transcend the various religious orthodoxies prevailing at the time, whether promulgated by Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. Thus, adherents force war, ethnic, religious, and political boundaries to strive toward the essential unity of human experience and seek knowledge through rationality. Francis Bacon, a Freemason, writing in the New Atlantis, describes such a utopian community. The Royal Society was founded after Bacon's death by Charles II, believed to be of Jewish descent. Elias Ashmole was a member. 
it had at its purpose to bring into being a new civilization called Solomon's House. All right. This is what they were planning. All right. It's in the New Atlantis book, Francis Bacon. We're going to read more into that book. I've read it a little bit in previous videos. This is what um, they were planning to do, trying to call it Solomon's House here in America. Churton writes, The potent image of Solomon's house was derived from Sir Francis Bacon's allegorical fable, New Atlantis, which was first appeared as an addendum to his Sylvia Silvarum, or Natural History in 10 Centuries, published a year after Bacon's death in 1627. New Atlantis tells of a ship that arrives at a mysterious island called Ben Salem. All right, listen to this, Ben Salem, Arabic for Sons of Peace. The voyagers are greeted cautiously by a people of inviolable educational and psychological endowments. The narrator is informed of how they came to be a people of such advanced attainments. An ancient patriarch had established an order on the island and the islanders had proved faithful to his inspiration. The patriarch's name was Solamona. Inhabitants of Ben Salem seem familiar with Rosicrucian imagery. A scroll first delivered to the travelers before they are permitted to land is signed with a stamp of cherubim wings, not spread by hanging downwards, and by them a cross. This image is reminiscent of those under the protective eye of the Rose Cross Brothers, Sub Umbra, Alarum, Tuarum, Jehovah, it says, or oh, Hawa, right? Under the shadow of Jehovah's wings. So maybe they're Jehovah, huh? Bacon's aim was to get people from the known to the unknown, from worshiping God in his house, church, to examining God's creation in his other house, the universe or temple of nature. His idea goes back to hermetic and natural philosophic sources, hermetics. Off sources that Bacon shared with Elias Ashmole. To return to Bacon's story, having been permitted to land on the island, the travelers to Ben Salem are informed of a king, the island's lawgiver, Solamona, who had established the island's distinctive organization 1,900 years earlier, which would place this at the time of the fall of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. Ye shall understand, my dear friends, that amongst the excellent acts of that king, one above all, we talking, are we just talking about the prester? Are we just talking about the prester here? We talking about that priest king? One above all has the preeminence. It was the erection and institution of order or society, which we call Solomon's house, the noblest foundation, as we think, that ever was upon the earth and the lantern of this kingdom. It is dedicated to the study of the works and creatures of God. I find in ancient records this order of society is sometimes called Solomon's house, sometimes the College of the Six Days works, whereby I am satisfied that our excellent king had learned from the Hebrews that God had created the world and all that therein is within six days, and therefore he instituted that house for the finding out of the true nature of all things, whereby God might have the more glory in the workmanship of them and men the more fruit in the use of them. All right, again, that was reading from this guy, uh, Churton, all right, talking about the New Atlantis, his interpretation. All right, this is what they were trying to do again, set up shop here. The prevailing philosophy embraced by Freemasons at the time of the English colonization of the New World went beyond conventional religions and ethnic divisions to embrace the universality of human brotherhood, essentially an Islamic and crypto-Muslim concept. Again, what, what brotherhood, human, New World Order, Brotherhood universally human universality of human brother essentially an Islamic crypto Muslim concept. This enlightened perspective played a large role in opening the door for persons of diverse and often persecuted origins to make their way to the new Atlantis, new Atlantis of North America. Where's the old one? It's the same one. So we continue in the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, A Genealogical History. This part says here, John Skeen. One particular Freemason who made the journey was John Skeen, 
the name derives from the family's hereditary office at the Scottish court of regulating the measure of wool, known as skeins. John Skeen is the first Freemason to set foot in North America and coincidentally an ancestor of co-author Elizabeth Caldwell Hirschman, right? One of the author's ancestors or shit. They know what they're talking about here. He arrived in 1682 in the New Jersey colony from Aberdeen, Scotland. As Han writes, John Skeen made a Freemason in 1682 in Aberdeen, Scotland, and who migrated to Burlington, New Jersey, shortly thereafter is the first known Mason in America. Sursa provides additional discussion, noting that several Masons and their families immigrated to New Jersey from Scotland with Skeen. All those names are probably of crypto-Jewish descent. All right, deep one right there, just in case you run into this. Among those attracted by the liberal colonization terms was John Skeen in October 1682, he came to the area with his wife and several other men who were members of Aberdeen Lodge. He settled at Burlington in West Jersey, one of the two provinces of New Jersey. The others did not remain, but returned soon thereafter to the old country. The list of members of Aberdeen Lodge for the year 1670 named Harry Elphinston as the master. He was the booking agent who arranged passage on the vessel Henry and Francis. The arrangement for the trip was made under the sponsorship of the Earl of Perth, a Freemason, John Forbes, a Freemason, and others. John Forbes came to New Jersey in 1684. He settled in Plainfield but returned to Scotland the following year. John Skeen remained, however, and soon after his arrival was elected to the Assembly. Later, under Governor Edward Belingi, he became Deputy Governor and also presided as judge of the court at Burlington. John Skeen continued to serve as a deputy governor until his death in 1690. As is widely appreciated, Scotland was the first country to establish Freemason lodges. Northern states, in Scotland, the two lodges in Edinburgh, Mary's Chapel and Kilwinning, held the privilege of forming new lodges. Kilwinning was given the significant title of Mother Lodge and practiced a unique right that has become known as the right of Kilwinning. There are a number of lodges in Scott's Freemasonry that grew out of the Kilwinning Mother Lodge and formed in various localities throughout the region, even in Edinburgh. The Shaw Statutes make mention of another lodge, that of Stirling which also held authority over a certain number of workshops, a fourth very old Scottish lodge, one which the Shaw statutes does not mention, but which can be found in city documents of 1483, is the Lodge of Aberdeen. The Scottish lodges had, as their judges and hereditary patrons, who would now be called Grand Masters, the St. Clairs, Barons of Roslyn, and Earls of Orkney and Caithness, I Caith Cathy, Cath Caithness, Cathars, Caithness, Cathay, Cata, Black. This hereditary privilege went back to the Scottish King James II, who in 1438 granted the right of jurisdiction to the masters of the Scottish lodges. They were authorized by him to establish personal tribunals, and in all the large cities, using the proceeds from a four-pound tax levied on each mason graduating to the rank of master, so that the privileges of Freemasons would be protected. Furthermore, the lodge masters were authorized to impose an admission fee on each new member, a document delivered by the Masons of Scotland. In 1628, and signed by all the lodge representatives confirmed to William St. Clair's successor, the dignity and hereditary rights of this same position. All right, so before I continue, just wanted to go over the image they're showing here of we've seen before, most likely George Washington. Uh, if you guys haven't, this is an image of him and his uh, Freemasonic gear and, you know, symbology. Um, now, Dodge the Hijack again with the white washing. You know, we got a future video. <laughs> Yeah, Swarty Washington, yeah. So it says here, Washington as a Mason, 
print collection, Miriam and Ira D. Wallace Division of Arts, prints and photographs, all right? So that's when they do it as a mason, okay? Freemasons. We can still find a trace in Scotland of other officers exercising jurisdiction over several lodges. For example, a charter granted by King James IV on November 25th, 1590, conferred upon Patrick Copland of Udog the right to exercise the office of First Warden of the Freemasons in the district of Aberdeen, Banff, and Kinkardine. All right, we continue. In the book, it says here, Colonial Freemasonry Symbols. It is no secret that Freemasons were involved in the founding of America. According to one writer who has delved into the subject, of the 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence, nine, according to some, 53, according to others, were Freemasons. Okay? This is deep history right here, if you didn't know. Okay? Masonic imagery appears on the seal of the United States, as well as its money in addition to those of the states of Connecticut, Delaware, New Jersey, North Carolina, and South Carolina. These display the same familiar images of the Kabbalah, Gnosticism, Hermetic symbols, and alchemy, esoteric traditions introduced into European thought by Sephardic Jews and Muslim thinkers. They introduced that, okay? It's not the white man. We notice the two pillars of Hakim and Boaz, the sun or all-seeing eye, representing God, a book that could be the Torah, Quran, Bible, or recorded learning, circle with central dot, Pythagorean right angles, moon, Doth, Luna, again, moon, who, Doth, Luna, Luna, Doth, moon, Doth is the moon, moon god, Dodge the hijack, be careful what you're worshiping and following, putting your power to. Doth, Luna, and stars, the luminaries. Clearly, the images and philosophy of the Sephardic diaspora were carried over to North America. All bore a distinctly anti-Spanish and anti-Catholic stamp. We review now these books discussing the American colonies conventionally identified as Freemasons. The first Ronald F. Heaton's book on the Founding Fathers provides biographical information on prominent colonial Freemasons. We place the initials SJ after those we propose to be of a Sephardic Jewish descent, simply J for Jewish. Among those listed by Heaton are Benedict Arnold, who's Sephardic Jew, all right? Mordecai Gist, Sephardic Jew. Rufus King, Sephardic Jew. Benjamin Lincoln, an ancestor of President Abraham Lincoln. Listen up, an ancestor. Told you Abraham Lincoln, so-called black, right? And I knew on his dad's side, they were like German, you know, supposedly German Quakers, you know, but these were what? One of his was what? A Sephardic Jew, Benjamin Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's ancestor, and George Washington, and George Washington. Hodup's more recent book, Solomon's Builders, lists Daniel Campbell. I remember Campbell, the family, these were black Europeans, Sephardic Jew, it says here, the Grand Master of Virginia, the Marquise de Lafayette, and Andrew Jackson, Sephardic Jew, Marquise de Lafayette, Benjamin Franklin, or Franklin, Franklin, Sephardic Jew, Paul Revere, Rivera, Sephardic Jew, remember he was a Huguenot, Paul Revere, John Hancock, Dr. Joseph Warren, Sephardic Jew, James Otis, James Galloway, Peyton Randolph, Richard Henry Lee, Sephardic Jew, ancestor of Robert E. Lee of the Confederacy, Sephardic Jew, okay? William Dawes, Dawes is David, remember that, who wrote with Revere, Paul Revere, Sephardic Jew, William Dawes, Dawes is David, James Monroe, John J. Robert Livingston, Sephardic Jew, John Marshall, William Patterson, John Blair, it says just J, just Jew, <laughs> Jacob Broom, Daniel Carroll, John Dickinson, Nicholas Gilman, just Jew, John Wise, Jew, David Stewart, Jew, Elisha Cullen Dick, John Duffy, Jew, Valentine Reinsell, Jew, Haim Solomon, Sephardic Jew, Eliphaz Levi, Jew, Benjamin Latrobe, 
Morgan Lewis, a Jew, Arthur St. Clair, Jew, Elias Bodinot, Jew, Nathan Gorman, Jew, and John Severe or Shavir, Sephardic Jew. In Colonial Freemasonry, edited by Lewis Cook, various authors discuss the Masonic membership of famous figures throughout the original 13 American colonies. Connecticut, Freemasons were led by Master Mason Jehoshaphat Star, Arabic and Hebrew for promissory note, Sephardic Jew. Another Connecticut Freemason is Benjamin Isaacs, who, although known to be Jewish, nonetheless attached himself to the local Episcopal, Episcopal Church to avoid anti-Jewish legislation then enforced. He is remembered as the designer of the Great Seal of the United States. The designer, this is the guy. All right. This is the guy that designed it. We were just showing you. Other Connecticut Masons include Joel Clark, Joseph Perry, Daniel Moulton, Samuel Mott, John Barrett, Jonathan Hart, Bilios, Hebrew Bilha, Ward, Israel Putnam, Seth Warner, Ezra Stiles, and Dr. Saul or Saul Pell all of whom we propose to be of Jewish ancestry and orientation. Delaware had as Freemasons Colonel Charles Pope, Peter Jaquette, Caleb Bennett, Thomas Mendenhall from Portuguese Mendes, Dr. Joseph Capel and Joseph in Israel, Israel. In Georgia, the permanent lodge was Solomon's Lodge No. 1 of Savannah. It was derived from the Grand Lodge in London and organized by Georgia's founder, James Oglethorpe, okay? Together with a group of men led by Moses and Daniel Nunes, or Nunez, in 1734, part of the original boatload of Jews in Savannah. According to Mike, Mikey Israel, rabbi historian Reuben, it was the second constituted Masonic Lodge in North America. The Lodge counted among its members Roger Holland, Elijah Dobry, known Jews, Moses and Daniel Nunez, James Harbersham, Gray Elliott, Peter Tondi, Thomas Elf, Oliver Lewis, and Balthasar Schaffer, Ashkenazi, Stuart Trusty, all of whom likewise were of probable or certain Jewish ancestry. Benjamin Sheftal was a, a past master of the lodge. Among its most active members were heroes of the American Revolution. The overtly Jewish Masons of this lodge created the Union Society, an early interfaith organization headed by Episcopalian and Catholic and a Jew. Massachusetts had a lengthy and detailed history of Freemasonry. Its first Grand Master was Henry Prince. All right, listen. Members include Isaac De Costa. Right, De Costa. We already know that the Costa family, Sephardic Jew, Dr. Joseph Warren, Jeremiah French, Seth Dean, Deani, Paul Revere, Joel Stark, Jonathan Hart, Benjamin Tupper, John Lowell, Tadeus Harris, Moses Mordecai Hayes, William Schoole, Thomas Denny, Denny or Dionysos. Job Prince, Caleb Swan, Jewish house sign, and Samuel Barat, all may be presumed to be of probable Jewish or Muslim ancestry and cognizant of it. New Hampshire's first Freemasons Lodge was formed in 1739. Among its charter members were Charles Facey, or Fasi, from Fez, Morocco, likely either a Sephardic Jew or Muslim Moor. Elias Ashmole had close connections with Morocco in the mid-late 1600s. As already pointed out, it also included Nicholas Gilman, who signed the Constitution and Revolutionary War hero James Benton, as well as Samuel Cherry and Amos Emerson, example Emir or Amir son, Prince's son, Luther Emmys, Benjamin Ellis, Joshua Goldsmith, Benjamin Keane, Beza Leal Woodward, Nathaniel Adams, Joseph Bass, Joseph Bass, Bass, Nathaniel Folsom, and Alpheus Arabic Moore. 
All these, again, were likely Jews, crypto Jews, Muslims, or crypto Muslims. Again, all these, all these were what you already know, people of color. New Jersey Freemasons included William Tucky, Tucky Ashkenazic Tuck, Tuckman, Cloth, Rag, Jewish, David Jameson, John Blanchard, Isaiah Wool, John Moe, Jewish, William Patterson, William Makisak, son of Isaac, Jewish, Moses Ogden, Jewish, John Jacob Faesh, Fez, Jewish, and Jonathan Rhea, King, Jewish. One of the early lodges in New Jersey was named Nova Caesarea, after the Roman city in Israel, now Beit Shean. Nova Caesarea, in fact, became a sobriquet for the entire state of New Jersey. The seal of the Lodge of New York displays several figures from the Kabbalah, the Ark of the Covenant, Guardian Cherubim, and the Lion Rampant Eagle, Bull, and Man surrounded by Acacia Leaves. Among its colonial-era members were Francis Goelet, Jewish, Sir Henry Moore, Abraham Savage, Jewish, Isaac Heron, Jewish, Henry Franken, Jewish, Philip Livingston, Jewish, Theodore Van Wyck, Peter Van Brew Livingston, and William Tucky, Tucky, Tucky Jewish. Tucky composed a choral version of the 133rd Psalm in Hebrew to commemorate their meeting. Uh, it says below, other New York Freemasons included Sev Warner, Jewish, John Chapman from Jacob, Jewish, Morgan Lewis, Jewish, Moses Michael Hayes, Jewish, and Moses Spruley, Jewish. The book, The Ahiman Reson, used by all colonial lodges, Reson means prince, was authored by Francois Xavier Martin, a native of Marseilles, who immigrated to North Carolina and served as Grand Master of Freemasons in that state. He was very likely Jewish, as was without a doubt Thomas Cooper, the provincial Grand Master, a carpenter, and the son of William Cooper, the scout for Daniel Boone. Thomas Cooper founded one of the earliest lodges in North Carolina, Greenville Masonic Lodge, at a crown point in Pitt County in 1776. His mother was Elizabeth Cannon, Canaan, Canyon Canaan and his uncle at the same name had married Sarah Anthony of the London Jewish merchant family previously mentioned. The entire Cooper clan moved from the Cooper Plantation in Surrey County, Virginia, across the river from Jamestown to Buffalo Creek in North Carolina about 1755. There, with other Jews, crypto Jews, and Scotsmen in exile after the Battle of Culloden. They helped establish Butte County, named for the free thinker John Stewart, Earl of Butte, Lord of the Treasury, and first Scottish Prime Minister of Great Britain. Butte County had a courthouse southeast of the present-day city of Warrington that simultaneously served as the Blanford Butte Lodge. This was a hotbed of radicalism in the days of following the Stamp Act of 1765. Sermons were preached there on Saturdays, and the religious affiliation was clearly not Christian. It was not, was clearly not Christian. Nearly every one of the 600 residents in the county treasonously signed a declaration of independence from George III that predated by 10 years the one in Philadelphia. Most of them were Freemasons. Among the obvious Jewish names are Moses and Samson Myers. Butte County lay on the Okanichi Indian Trail and served as a staging area for Daniel Boone's exploration. This is how they did it. They set up shop right on the trail. So again, this would serve as a staging area for Daniel Boone's exploration and the eventual settlement of Kentucky and Tennessee. It long continued to have a Jewish and Masonic character. The tiny remote town of Warrington attracted Moses Mordecai, one of the first 300 Jews in the colonies, whose son married the daughter of a well-known New York jeweler, Myers Myers. Mordecai and his wife founded an Orthodox Jewish Women's Academy in Warrington in 1808. The town today makes the impression of a sleepy 
backwater, but its antebellum homes in a variety of styles ranging from Italianate and Moorish. All right, its homes are what Moorish to colonial and Georgian are considered smart, architecturally significant showpieces of the old South. Other North Carolina Freemasons of ostensibly Jewish or Muslim heritage include Cornelius Harnett, Caleb Granger, Joshua Toomer or Tumar, John Salter, William Tryon, French surname Daniel Lowell, Silas Arnett, diminutive of Aaron, Patrick Garvey, Hardy Murphy, William Brimage, Stephen Cabarrus, as in the Spanish Jewish financier Francis Cabarrus, John Murray, Abner Neal, William Moore, example Moore, all right, Moore, I ain't making it up, John Getty, Gadis from Cadiz, John Ashey, and John Macon. And continues, it says here, Psalm 133. So it says, this is the King James Version, right? It says, 133.1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that cometh down upon the collar of his garments. Like the dew of Hermon that cometh down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forever. So this is a supposed Hebrew transliteration here, as it says. And it says, this version of the psalm is from the Jewish Publication Society, JPS, and translation of the Hebrew Bible published in 1917. The Pennsylvania Freemasons were chartered under the Duke of Norfolk, who served as the Grand Master of England and who was a social contact of Elias Ashmole. The Duke of Norfolk has always been considered the preeminent duke in the English parish. The roots of the dukendom go back to the bigot Picard of Mowbray from Montbray in Normandy, an important Templar name, and Howard Highwarden families. Typically, the Duke of Norfolk holds the hereditary royal office of Earl Marshal of England and Pennsylvania, Members of the Duke's Lodge of probable Jewish or Muslim ancestry are William Pringle, Thomas Boudet, French Boudaios, Benjamin Franklin, and Daniel Coxey, Thomas Hart, Thomas Bond, Sephardic Bondi, Biondi, Philip Sung, Singh, Cantor, Thomas Catwald Lader, Arabic for firstborn son, William Ball, Humphrey Moray, and Joseph Shippen, Dutch. Rhode Island was known even in colonial times as a haven for non-traditional religious adherents such as Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. It had a large and prosperous Sephardic Jewish population. The presence of Jews and Muslims among its settlers and Freemasons is to be expected. Moses, John, and Joseph Brown for Pardo, Brown is Pardo or Brown, Abraham Whipple, John Waterman, William Ellery, Silas Talbot, Jabez Bowen, Moses Satius, Pellick, Clark, many of these were members of King David's Lodge. South Carolina's first Freemasons met at Solomon's Lodge in Charleston, which viewed with Savannah for the title of the Supreme Council of Scottish Rite Masonry. Of the nine patriarchs who founded it, four were open Jews, Emmanuel de la Mota, Treasurer General Abraham Alexander, Secretary General Israel de Lieben, and Moses C. Levi, Inspector General. We would categorize others in the membership as crypto-Jewish or crypto-Muslim. James Gramey, Maurice Lewis, James Michy, James Gordon, Thomas Denny, Barnard Elliott, and John Ged Geddes. Finally, in Virginia, we would include among well-known Freemasons Peyton Randolph and John Blair as being of Jewish descent. Notably, the first Masonic Lodge in Virginia was created in Alexandria, named for the city in Egypt. Hmm, what if that's the original Alexandria? As a coda, let us not forget to observe that with Judaism, the history of Freemasonry in this country is integrally bound up with the traditions of the Cherokee and other Indians. Oh, big one right there. Again, just like Judaism, 
the history of Freemasonry in this country is integrally bound with the tradition of the Cherokee and other Indians. The common denominator was undoubtedly Sephardic Jews. This is what was common about all of them. They had this in their blood. The name Luni from Spanish Portuguese Luna and Hebrew Jarek Moon was born by more than one Cherokee chief. All right. That was not a indigenous name. The admix chief Black Fox, 1805-1811, was also known as Henry White and called by Washington the Cherokee King, had his seat in Creek Path on Sand Mountain in northern Alabama. His sister married John Looney, a Cumberland pioneer whose forebears entered the colonies through Pennsylvania from the Isle of Man. His nephew was Chief John Looney, who signed the Act of Union between Eastern and Western Cherokees in 1839. William Weber, also called Red-Headed Will, was the son of a British officer, father named Weber and Cherokee woman, who was the mother also of Ostenaco, a Cherokee chief painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds in 1762. When we visited England, both chiefs were related to black-headed copper, recorded as Chickamauga chief. The Webbers intermarried with the Vons, prominent in the Cherokee hierarchy before and after removal. Sarah Weber married John Brown, a family whose surname we have noticed more than once. Chief Will's daughter, Betsy Weber, married Chief John Looney's. Their daughter, Eliza Abigail Looney, married Daniel Ratlin Gord. Another daughter, Eleanor, married General Elias Stan Wati, whose family openly followed the ways of Islam. Yet another daughter, Rachel, married John Navi, the grandson of Daniel Ross and Mary MacDonald, parents of Chief John Ross, Watugan, leader John Looney's son by his Indian wife was Moses Looney, who married Mary Guest, Gist, the granddaughter of Sequoia's father, Nathaniel Gist. Moses pursued warfare until the Cherokee were completely defeated, then settled down on a plantation in Lawrence County, Alabama, where he died in 1855. In a rare print preserved by family members from the earliest days of photography, he is shown in Masonic regalia. We continue in the book, it says, Summing up, the story of Freemasonry unites many of the themes of this book. The striving of Jews scattered in exile by the forces of persecution to build a new Jerusalem in the absence of a real homeland. The search for a free Harmonious society expresses of the Sephardic Jewish ideals remembered in a collective repression from the long centuries of the coexistence of the three faiths in Moorish Spain and southern France, and the practice of a scientific approach to knowledge and religion grounded in remote antiquity, one that was at once rational and mystical. We're talking about hermetics. All these attainments beckoned to the immigrants from every corner of Europe and the Mediterranean who settled and populated what became the United States of America. It must count as no accident that the government's emblems of state, its monuments, and national literature reflect those origins, all right? What Moorish Sephardic, all right, from the Masonic imagery on its money to the classical architecture of its capital city. Despite the obvious, nobody can fail to raise important questions about the actors in this drama. One concerns the nature of crypto-Judaism. We know that when the Spanish-Portuguese Beavis Marx synagogue in London was dedicated in 1703, some families in attendance were returning to what they believed the true and correct practice of Judaism after a lapse of 300 years. They weren't doing it. In many cases, their ancestors had gone underground with the first riots against Jews in Spain in 1391. It is an easy leap to reason that after the expulsion of Jews from England in 1290, there were many who persisted in their traditions until the proper time and place came for revealing themselves. From 1300 to 1600 is a like period of time. A faith with thousand-year-old roots could easily persist and persevere. 
Moreover, there was a steady drift of Spanish and Portuguese Jews into the British Isles after 1492. The fact that many English Jews, some of them underground since the reign of Henry I, went to Scotland after 1490 can only mean that a lamp of hope always flourished to the north, one that welcomed refugees from France, Spain, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Germany, the Ottoman Empire. The persistent patterns of intermarriage and naming documented in this book suggest that Jewish identity survived if it did not grow or flourish. It bore throughout its history the stamp it received from French Jews who accompanied William the Conqueror. Scottish, Irish, French, and English Jews were naturally open to being revigorated by those of the parent culture. So why we might also ask, was there such a gulf in America between the crypto Jews and those openly branded as such the real Jews? I would parentheses with Hebrew names and places of origin like Poland and Lithuania. Why, if the families we have argued to be Jewish actually were Jewish in their sympathies and loyalties, not neutral or anti-Jewish, did the process of consolidation and solidarity fail to crystallize? Why were Sephardic Jews so often at odds with Ashkenazic Jews? Listen to this. This is deep what he's saying. How come they not remember? What's going on? What happened? Was there a war between the Sephardic and Ashkenazi people? Who took over the Sephardic Jews' businesses and everything they created in America? Who really took who took over? It's a different type of Jew today, huh? Why did so many of both denominations cease to identify as Jews, seizing the expediency of finally converting to Christianity or becoming secularized or agnostic, to the extreme of denying their Jewish roots altogether? The answers to these questions inevitably have to do with the complacency and conservatism of the upper class in the British Isles. Today it is estimated that 80 to 90% of the land and its income in England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland is controlled by aristocracy and gentry. Such a statistic brings into even more telling relief the role of Jews in colonial America, where the revolt against privilege was joined in many cases by the very scions of old English and Scottish families. Jews and Muslims played into this dynamic with leading roles. These are some of the mega questions that traditional mainstream American historians have avoided asking, whether consciously or unconsciously, I would say more consciously. All right, they kept all this history from us. Undoubtedly, it has been for the same reasons that the named and unnamed in our chronicle chose to remain secret and did not openly embrace a Jewish presence or identity. Answers cannot be found until questions are raised. In this spirit, we hope that our compilation can inspire others to see colonial history through a different lens. The true vision of our forefathers and foremothers will only be clear to us after painstaking research, do your genealogy, after numerous new biographies, systematic local histories, and countless case studies probing into the long centuries of silence. Too many years of silence, all right? Too many years of silence. And I just want to say, guys, you know, this was chapter 10. You guys have been great with me through all these chapters in this book. So be very proud of yourselves. You guys read a whole book with me. If you've watched every episode, every chapter of this book, every video I've done on every chapter, you guys have read the entire book. Again, this was a genealogical history, Jews and Muslims in British colonial America. This was the, the history. We got the history, a little bit of the history of Freemasonry and how that connected to the Sephardic Moorish people who were helping colonize America, who be, became known as founding fathers. Right? These are people of color. Don't forget. This was a very deep book. I hope you guys enjoyed this book. I always enjoy it. Make sure to go back to the videos whenever you need reference uh, for this book. It was a great book. Make sure to get it on your own so you can have it as a source. 
Again, this was Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America. Shout out to the authors, Elizabeth Hirschman and Daniel Jates. If you guys ever listen to me, I hope you guys don't take it personal. We were just trying to build and learn together as a community. Again, because this was silence, as you guys said, the author said it just now. This information was silence, and I feel like this should be shared and shouldn't be charged or anything like that. Thank you once again for writing this, and thank you guys for joining me. So again, be proud of yourself. You read a whole book, all right? You read a whole book. This was a deep video. It can could have got a lot deeper, but a lot of the information was put out here. It's for you to, you know, analyze it, think about what's, what you heard. Shout out to you for reading the whole book. Much love and respect to everybody who tuned in. Pura vida, mi gente. Mucho amor y mucha paz para mi gente. Much love and much peace and blessings. All right. Hawa. I have something else I can look at. And you may disagree with it, but it's important if you disagree with the Bible, that's fine, whatever. But you have to understand the role it played in history and why this matters. We are connected to Israel. We are wound in so deeply to Israel, and most people don't even know it. The Bible and our own history shows us how, and I'm going to show you just a couple of things tonight. And this is a history that I'm teaching to my own family um, because too many people no longer care about our history, no longer care about the history of, you know, God. They don't care. And they're trying to change our history to fit an agenda. But the Israelites, the um, lost ten tribes, they went north and they started to scatter the other direction and they went to the coastlines, generally in the area where our pilgrims came from. Judah kept the Torah alive. Those who were taken captive by the Assyrians, Caucasians, over the mountains, and they started to populate the western part of Europe. All of western civilization is based on the laws of Israel. And our entire history is directly tied to this moment. You might not buy into the olives and the branches and everything else. It's fact. It's fact. But there's no way to deny that the majority of our laws come directly from the scriptures, right directly from Deuteronomy. And the Bible comes from Judah. Not the northern tribe, the southern. Judah. They were supposed to preserve it, and they did. We owe the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we owe our support and our allegiance. Without the Torah, without the people of Judah, you have no law. Ours doesn't exist. Our country doesn't exist. Nothing exists. You get rid of the Torah. You get rid of the Bible. Nothing, nothing works anymore. Then what are our laws based on? Opinion. Man's opinion. Oh, well, that's good. This is why I care about Israel and what we're going to do tonight. If Israel goes, if the Bible goes, you need an entirely new way to govern. Because ours is, is nonsense then. <laughs>